So this Doctrine for Life series is one that we plan to just kind of periodically revisit, take a few doctrines at a time, have another type of class, take a few more doctrines, just kind of alternate that through our regular diet of what we're all seeking to grow in. And I'm really excited about the format for it. We're going to be, uh, this series is based on Paul Tripp's book, which I don't know, I think it comes with a cover on it, but I always take those off. But uh, Paul Tripp's book, Do You Believe? And then the subtitle is 12 Historic Doctrines to Change Your Everyday Life. And so right from the get-go, um, it's emphasizing this fact that doctrine is life-changing. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But even the way that the book is arranged is one that um, it talks about the doctrine at first, and then there's a whole chapter just applying that doctrine. So Paul Tripp has done this amazing job on this immensely edifying work that if you're looking for something to read along as we go through this, this book is worth, it's worth the wait. It's a heavy book too, so it's kind of cool. looks nice on your shelf. But it's also a great book. And then it has these orange pages with these artistic shapes that I just... I think of Matt Stone when I see this. Like, look, it's just shapes, and they change with each orange thing. And anyhow, you could spend hours just looking at the shapes. So that's what we're going to be going through, and uh, I'm excited about it. And so today, we're going to just kind of talk about the intro. His, his intro to the book really sets up how we think about doctrine. And I'd imagine we're all coming to the table with different ideas of what that word means. And so we'll talk about that a little bit this morning. Uh, and then as we have time, if we have time, we'll move into that first doctrine, which is the doctrine of Scripture. So we'll talk about the doctrine of Scripture. Then uh, after we spend a few weeks on that and applying that, we'll talk about the doctrine of God. Uh, and then I believe it's the doctrine of holiness, which is actually a really uh, neat way to go as we think through theology proper. So Anyhow, why don't I pray, and then we'll, we'll dive into this. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you love us enough to give us your word, and that you love us enough to bring instruction to us. The world resounds with things that are pointing us to you all the time as we see them in creation, and yet you have so specially loved us that you've drawn near in Christ, and you give us all that we need for life and godliness. We pray that as we talk about these things, that you would help us, that you would shape our understanding of who you are, who we are, and what we need from you so desperately through Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right. So, introduction. The dangerous dichotomy. This is what Paul Tripp talks about. And he begins the book by speaking about a seminary professor. Um, that he was called in to counsel. Paul Tripp does counseling in some pretty high-profile situations. And he speaks of this situation where this professor who can amazingly articulate theology better than almost anyone, um, known for it, writes about it, asked to speak about it, yet at home his life is a far cry from the love and grace that he speaks about and writes about. And Paul Tripp explains he's been called in to help this man, and the man doesn't even see his need. He doesn't see the lack of grace, the lack of love, the, the harm that's happening there. And this isn't just a danger for um, those who teach theology. This isn't just a danger for seminary professors or for pastors, but this dichotomy or this division that can happen between what we profess and how we live it's something that can affect all of us in various ways. In fact, I would say it does affect all of us to varying degrees. And that's part of what we want to be aware of. But it could be a woman who's constantly reading devotionals and listening to worship music or studying the scriptures for herself, still struggling with, with fear and lashing out in anger. There, there could be all kinds of situations that way. It could be another man who's not a seminary professor but maybe thought of well in the church and yet treats his wife and children poorly or is struggling with secret sins that no one really knows about. And all the while, the, the danger of it is when there, that contrast, that contradiction that's happening isn't addressed, when we don't realize that that gap is problematic. And if we think about it, we've probably all seen this in other people in some way, maybe in a profoundly theological way, I think if we're honest, we all see it in ourselves too, right? 
I, I'm confident that anyone sitting here, and I don't think I'm just a pessimist, but has a functional gap between what we say we believe and how we live our lives. That's just part of um, this process of sanctification, this side of glory. One day those things will be perfectly united. Boy, won't that be brilliant. Um, but in the meantime, there is this contrast that we see. And so our goal in the Christian life is to see this as a process to be addressing, not something to ignore or something to intentionally or unintentionally be actually feeding. There are ways we can approach Scripture. There are ways we can approach doctrine. There are ways we can think about the Christian life that are actually driving this wedge further and further. And that's what we want to be aware of. And Paul Tripp mentions this contradiction, this dichotomy between what we believe and how we live is problematic, and more than that, it is dangerous. It's a dangerous dichotomy. He says this, and I think this is insightful. I am persuaded that the gap between the doctrine we say we believe and the way we actually live is a workroom for the enemy. The enemy of your soul will gladly give you your formal theology if in your real daily life he can control the thoughts and motives of your heart and in so doing control the way you act, react, and respond. I find that sobering, right? That, that Satan, we think of like screw tape letters or something like that, where we, we kind of think about the mind of how the enemy would work to undo Christians. And one way that can happen is by wholeheartedly giving doctrine. It's not that he has to withhold it in order to do destruction. It's when this dichotomy is allowed to exist. And so we want to keep this danger of knowing stuff, that doesn't affect how we live. We want to keep it in mind throughout this entire series as we continue to revisit these doctrines. Because ultimately, it's not a problem with doctrine. It's not a problem with God's truth. It's not a problem with the information from God's word. What is the problem? It's in here. It's our hearts, right? It's how we are tempted to respond or not respond to what God is seeking to do in his word and by these beautiful truths of the scripture. So we want to understand what doctrine is and what it's supposed to do. And so if you're following along in your handout with that beautiful uh, artwork that's there um, of this growth process by the divine hand, um, we can go inside now, but although you can keep looking at that picture if you want to, you can flip back and forth. Um, but we are inside at um, the second point there, the importance of doctrine. Let's talk about why is doctrine important and how is it supposed to function? And then we'll be able to discuss some of that together. But I just want to start by thinking about how we are made. We as people made in the image of God are created as thinking beings. Thinking is a part of being human. There are, there are situations that that can vary in degrees, but you never have a thoughtless day. <laughs> Our lives are shaped by thoughts. You may think improperly, you may think inconsistently, but you are thinking. And all of us have constructed a superstructure of life assumptions that function as this instrument we use to make sense out of life. We are always making sense of the world we're living in, how we're responding, how people are treating us, and those things are shaped by our thoughts. And so in this way, Paul Tripp says, all of us, to some extent, are theologians. All of us are philosophers. All of us are counselors. And all of us are archaeologists who dig through the past to understand what was. We're all doing this all the time. And what's amazing is God understands this, and he has given us the Bible as image bearers who are thinkers. And he's revealed his word in such a way to engage us the way we need to be engaged. The Bible isn't just a book about religion that just kind of goes on the shelf for when we want to talk about religion with someone else or take a religious studies course. Paul Tripp says this, the Bible is a life book given for life purposes so that the creatures to whom it is given would look for life in the only place where life can be found. That's amazing, isn't it? Thinking of the scriptures themselves as 
a life book for us. He says the doctrines of the Bible are not so much ideology as they are living and divine tools of salvation, transformation, identity, and guidance. That's what we have. That's a lot different than a religious textbook. So how are we made? We are made as thinking beings, and the Bible comes to us to engage us as those who are created in that image of the creator. How is the Bible arranged? The Bible isn't arranged by topic, is it? I used to think that would have been such a better use of the Bible. <laughs> It'd be so nice if that concordance thing could kind of be the whole thing, and then maybe that other stuff is just like footnotes or something. I think you can tell bents that I might have. But the Bible isn't an encyclopedia. And the reason this is important is if you were to look up every verse about a topic, so look up every verse about parenting, right? and you read every verse about parenting, would you know all that the Bible needs you to know about parenting? There would be huge chunks of it that aren't subsumed under that encyclopedia article of parenting. Mostly like how God treats us as his children, how grace and sin affect these things, how weakness factors in, and all these different things that aren't going to be in this journal entry about Parents, train up your children in the way they should go, right? So it's not an encyclopedia. It's not a Bible dictionary, as helpful as they are, where it just walks through, this is Mary, this is what she did, here's how old she was, all these things. Those things are helpful, but that's not how it's arranged. And the Bible instead is essentially this grand, redemptive story. The Bible is a narrative from start to end. It starts with a story, ends with the conclusion of that story. But we can also say that the Bible is a theologically annotated story. So have you read those, um, you know, if you're reading like an old classic or something, and it has all these phrases, or you're reading something from maybe British literature, and they put something in the boot, and you're like, why do they put their groceries in their shoe? And you find out that's the trunk of the car. But you need like a little annotation to kind of explain what the story is laying out for you. That's a beautiful way to think about what the scriptures are doing. There's this overarching story, but throughout it, there are these explanations explaining the providential redemptive work of God so that as we hear it, we're not just interpreting that story in and of ourselves. We are getting the divine annotations, the divine footnotes to what God has been doing and will be doing all the way to the end. Um, and so we could say it's the sweeping story of God's plan and purpose of redemption accompanied by God's essential, explanatory, and applicatory, uh, applic applica application notes are part of it too. <laughs> so they explain things, but also say this is who God is, and also says, hey, by the way, if God has done all this, if this is who he is, this is what that means for you. Here's some application as well. All that stuff is mixed in to that. So I've been talking for a little bit. Let's just pause for a moment, and I want to hear from you. As you think about the Bible, and you can, it's not cheating to look at your Bible. It's totally fine. You can look at it, and you can flip through it. And as you think about the different books of the Bible that are there, there are different genres that are there, right? I'm going to let you tell me what they are. But, but just think about this. This is the question I'd like to engage in. As you think about the different parts of Scripture, what is good about the different ways God speaks to us in the Bible, like in these different types of narrative or poetry or something like that? Why is it good that those things are there and not just encyclopedia articles? So I think someone's running a mic for me. Jared, thank you. Man of many talents. Um, so just a reminder, the mic is so we can all hear you, but then people at home can hear your insights as well. So the Bible has all these different ways it talks to us. What is one of them, and, and why is it good that it does that? What does it engage in us? Yeah, Elise, and then we'll come back here. Yeah, Jared, you want to? I'm so glad about the narrative the narratives in both the old and the new, um, because I tend to think in story. Mm -hmm. And so being able to, like, put myself in a story yeah. and sort of 
think that way. I know that not everybody thinks in story, and that's probably why we have other things besides story. Yeah. But um, yeah, narrative. Nice. I have such an appreciation for the narrative of Scripture and how I think we are wired as people to varying degrees, as you mentioned. But we hear story and we insert ourselves into it as this framework of thinking about things. And so it's amazing. Yeah, Kevin? I know that when I was young, uh, all I was really interested in were the stories. Uh -huh. So that was very engaging. It was a way for, for someone who didn't understand the nuances of other things to be um, excited about what God was saying. Yeah. And then you move on into appreciation for other elements, for the poetry and for the understanding of doctrine and who Jesus is and all of those things, but you still have kind of this baseline that of, it just engages how we relate to it through our own lives. Yeah, it's really good. Bruce, maybe. Oh, Piper, sorry. Piper's, I, I didn't. But then it has to be a non-relative. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, kind of building off of what Elise and Kevin said, like, I, I think of the Bible as a way to, like, communicate with all the different ways that people think. So, like, for someone that builds off stories or for someone that needs, like, evidence or, mm -hmm. like, all these different things, our minds are insane, in, like, in a good way. <laughs> but, um, yeah. and we all think of things in different little ways. And so the Bible is like a smorgasbord of mm. all these things that you can just like pick out and like read through and think yeah. of a different way. And then it, I, I like to see and make fun of the people that make mistakes in the Bible. And that's what helps oh. me. So like <laughs> okay. you find out people's mistakes. I see. And so like having a person to like look at and be like, well, no, I am like that. Mm -hmm. in the Bible, like that, that's a, the part that helps me. Yeah. So. That narrative can be amazing at exposing how we're like that. And I'm just kidding. My dad can answer if he wants to, but, um, but non-relatives are also welcome as well. <laughs> we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I've probably been total opposite of the three that have shared so far, like, <laughs> because, um, you know, like, I, I like detail and, you know, uh, logic and stuff like that. Yeah. So the stories really bothered me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm really revealing some sinfulness in my heart here because, like, and then the stories, like, in school, I hated that. You know, I, I, I actually hated, like, how do you arrive at that, you know, and stuff like that. And so, um, you know, that's one thing that's been really cool is over the years, um, you know, God has been like chipping away at my heart and showing me, and, and, and that's one thing that, yeah, and then like apologetics, you know, that was one thing I really got hung up into is all, how do you refute all this, and how do you prove all this, and everything like that, instead of, you know, what an awesome God he is, and the whole narrative, and, and that's one thing that um, I've really grown to appreciate, is I love the narrative, and, and like the other stuff is not very important anymore. Hmm. So, mm -hmm. so I agree with all of you. <laughs> Yeah, Hank? Um, I like the epistles. I mean, I love poetry. I love historical books and narratives and stories. I love all that. But God, it's a letter to the church, to us. You have the seven letters to the churches, the way Paul's epistles are structured with, uh, you know, doctrine and then application. And it's very linear and easier to, to follow. Yeah. Um, but it then... All the other genres support, they all support each other. They do. And it's yeah. really amazing. Yeah. It's beautiful. Does anyone like poetry? Just out of curiosity, I'm curious. You already answered, but that's Kevin answered. Anyone? Everyone wrestles with it. Psalms? Yeah. Psalms is poetry. Anyone else? apocalyptic that just captures our imagination, peels back the curtain of things just beyond our imagination. It's pretty, it's amazing. And so anyhow, just pausing to think about that. Thank you, Jared. Um, I think it's really helpful. And then the other thing that I've grown in conviction about um, 
in life. I mean, you can see how I started. Like, stories are bad, and if the Bible were a spreadsheet, the world would be a better place. And uh, journeying along to see other parts of Scripture. To be honest, poetry has always been something that's super stretching to me. Like, I, I didn't like that in high school and things like that. But um, coming to see that God intentionally gave us the word with story, with letter, with profound argumentation, with imagery that just um, we have to ponder and chew, chew on, with axioms in the Proverbs that you just have to chew on for years to just see the layers of what's going on there. That wasn't an accident or just a trial and error of what kind of like movie would sell best or something like that. It was intentional because as we lean into that, even if those things may not be our default favorite, they um, fill out our humanity as we were created to be. We were created to engage on all those levels. And all of us have different aptitudes and variety and all that kind of stuff. But all of us as image bearers are hitting on all those levels and find those things um, to actually be essential for what they reveal to us about God. We need it revealed to us in story and poem and in didactic teaching things. And, and we're better for it. And so, um, yeah, that's great to hear. And then just to kind of summarize this part before we talk about why doctrine is helpful. But think about this. All these various parts of Scripture, they all help us, they help inform us on how we should live, though. Doctrinal things are shaping us of how we should live. Poetry is shaping how we should live. Um, narrative is shaping how we should live. And so Paul Tripp summarizes it like this. To the degree that every passage tells me things I need to know about God, things I need to know about myself, things I need to know about life in the fallen world, things I need to know about the disaster of sin, and things I need to know about the operation of grace. To that degree, every passage tells me something I need to know about every area of my life. Isn't that amazing how rich that is? And um, we may not always feel that. So the Bible's arranged that way. And then why is doctrine helpful? Why is doctrine helpful? Um, he gives two explanations. First, when we think of doctrine, I would just say we could define that as like the body of teachings in the Christian faith about its central beliefs, right? So we take our central beliefs and the teachings about those things. So theology proper, or doctrine of God, doctrine of scripture, doctrine of man, doctrine of Christ. It's the compiling together the core truths of that. Well, what is helpful about that? First, it is a helpful shorthand for the redemptive story. <clears throat> the Bible is a big book that is a long, multifaceted story, right? And we need ways sometimes to not rehearse the entire story and be able to talk about something about it. And so doctrine can do that. It can summarize a vast amount of content and his historical activity of God in one word. Um, and so like an example is justification, right? Justification is essentially what God did to secure our right standing, being justified before him. Like, boom, there's something in just a few words. But that's shorthand for all these images and statements and tensions that you feel building throughout Scripture and all these explanations of the multiple ways in which, through the sacrifice of Christ, this justification has come about. Um, and so it's a shorthand that I think is, is really helpful for us. And then second, every doctrine is also an explanation. It's also an explanation. <clears throat> and that's kind of the annotation part of it. But we wouldn't understand many of these stories or these narrative arcs if it weren't for the explanatory power of God's word. One way you could test this is if you read like, um, I'm trying to think of a better way to say it, but um, theological articles of people who aren't convinced of the inerrancy of scripture or like the supremacy of scripture, right? They can take stories that we know from childhood, and they're saying totally different things than what the Bible says those stories are actually about. 
Um, so we're dependent upon doctrine to help us understand what's going on here. For example, we've been going through the, the book of Ruth, right? And last week we heard Naomi's words about God witnessing against her and God being her enemy and all these things that she's saying. If we didn't have the rest of Scripture and if we didn't have doctrine, we'd be stuck saying, is God really against Naomi? Is God an enemy to her? Is there more going on here? And so doctrines about things like who God is, how he relates to his people, the doctrine of sin, and also the doctrine of the providence of God and salvation grace, all those things are coming to bear as we come to fuller understand this story that unfolds. And so those th two things interact. So doctrine gives us these explanations that also help us make sense of the story. They're the divinely revealed footnotes in that way. So that, those are a few reasons doctrine's helpful. And then uh, finally on this page, what should doctrine do? What should doctrine do? <clears throat> I think there are kind of two extremes, two sides of the horse or whatever it might be, about how people tend to approach the Bible and doctrine, um, mainly the Bible. On the one side, it's, it's a, I would summarize it as mystical, we could say. And so the Bible is approached by flipping to various parts of Scripture, um, maybe claiming verses, maybe repeating those verses. The, the way to read the Bible is to find out how you do it in a way that God is speaking to you, and that can mean all kinds of different things. And the, the barometer then for one's engagement with scriptures is, is the depth of experience one has in that, um, the perceived depthness of that. And so growing in the Christian life, kind of in that way of thinking, is primarily driven by a depth of experience. The deeper experience I have, the closer I must be to God, right? Right? Many of us have been a part of that. Many of us, I mean, we can gravitate toward different ways. These can be parts of our past or whatever it may be. But I think that's, that's one way we tend to go. Another way we may tend to go, and there's a whole spectrum in between, is the informational route. That learning facts, approaching the Bible as a set of propositions to be learned and to make everything fit together just right. Growth in the Christian life is really knowing a lot of things and being able to answer a lot of questions. It's kind of this informational side. And what I've found is a, many people maybe grow up more in a mystical side and become disillusioned with that when the experience ebbs and flows, and then maybe sometimes overreact to this purely informational model that like, that didn't really help me, but if I just know this stuff, it will be fine. Both of those have true things about them right? The illuminating power of God speaking to us in his word and that there's a, a mystery even in how it sanctifies and shapes us. And we need to know stuff, information, facts, those types of things, those help in our experience. But the way scripture speaks about how the Bible works, we could summarize as organic transformation. Organic transformation. When we look at the both propositional things it says, and then in a minute we'll look at the imagery that it gives. This just makes me sigh a breath of relief because <laughs> I've been caught up on both sides of that thing. And when I think about that experience, my heart starts beating fast in terms of like, how is it ever mystical enough? And then how can I ever know enough? And then also just the dangers that accompany both ways of that. But organic means it's living, it's alive, it's a living process. And then transformation obviously means that it's not just continuing how we are, but it is changing us and transforming us as it works in us. And so Isaiah 55 um, talks about that. And it uses this image that I think is helpful for us. You can see that there in your handout. It says in verse 10, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So it's going forth as water, works its work in the world, in the land. 
But then notice verse 13. In, instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is in this um, wilderness transformation imagery section of Isaiah, but what we find going on here is God's word is going out like water, causing this organic growth where it goes. And it's not returning empty, and it's accomplishing its purposes. It's, it's doing the growth that it was intended to do. But notice the transformation that it also talks about. If you go to the wilderness and water the wilderness, what shows up? Tumbleweed and these prickly pokey things that grow up like overnight like that with just a little bit of water. And um, the image here is that the water from God, uh, as his word goes forth, is so effective and transformational that it changes what naturally comes up and it transforms it into something different. And so what you have happening here is instead of thorns and briars, which are signs of the wilderness and the fall and being plunged into sin, instead forest and garden imagery abound. That's what he brings forth in his word. Um, thorns are transformed into a cypress tree, one of these tall evergreens that can be used for the building of the temple and things like that. Um, briars are transformed into myrtle, myrtle being this tree with dark leaves and white flowers and berries that gives off this perfume and is useful for so many things and was um, used in the feast of the tabernacle. And so you have, instead of tumbleweed, God's word comes, and what springs up out of it is restoration in Edenic beauty. And that is what God gives us as a picture of what his word does in us. Isn't that amazing to think about? That as, God, as we encounter God's word, and we do this in multiple ways, we are going to encounter his preached word, which is like, drinking from the fount of a beautiful rain shower, right? I mean, it is the, the thing that we depend on above all else. But even as we continue to encounter his word, as we read it ourselves or we speak about it, it is watering our dry and weary souls. And it is taking what naturally springs forth from our fallen hearts, and it's transforming it into things that speak of the glory of God restoring what has been broken by the fall. And so I, I just find that to be a beautiful image that really changes how I think about approaching the Bible, right? If, you, if you're on one of those other two sides, there's going to be a big burden as you come to it. Am I going to know enough at the end of this? Am I going to go deep enough today? What if I'm tired and it just doesn't work, <laughs> you know? But instead, it's I'm coming to the water, shower upon me, Right? And we think of how water functions. The, the agricultural imagery is all throughout Scripture of the sanctification process. And I think that's for such an important reason. And the further we get removed from agriculture, the harder it can be to, to think about those things. We just see lettuce pop up on a shelf and we don't realize like all the water that's gone into making lettuce, right? Um, but the agricultural imagery, if we think about how water functions, there are seasons to the watering, aren't there? And don't those parallel the Christian life so often too. I mean, we're going through a rainy season right now um, and there's, it's showering upon us. We've all had times in our lives where the watering effect of God's word, sanctification growth in these spurts, depth of understanding that happens. But then there's also times where the watering that's taken place is mostly through the dew or a little sprinkling that goes on. But you know what it does? That plant keeps growing and is sustained by that water. And so even as we think about, I mean, I think about the complexities of life and how often I'm, I'm talking with any of you, all of us together, and we're always, there's an ebb and flow about our, our prayer time and time in God's word and the complexity, my schedule's super crazy, or the kids, I can't even find a minute without them talking to me or all this kind of stuff. But can you go to the source of water and can you ask for God to change you by it? Um, and as you do, it does not return void. Um, and so I, I just think that imagery is sweet to our souls. Um, Paul Tripp says, God's truths or doctrines are the ecosystem in which the garden of personal transformation grows. 
That's what God is seeking to make in us. This, this fruit of the Spirit, this new creation life comes by the water of his word. Okay, let's just look at um, 2 Timothy 3.16, finish out this page, and then I'll, I'll open it up to hear from you all, all right? Um, we may wonder then, okay, how does God's word do this? How do we approach doctrine so that it is doing this for us? 2 Timothy 3.16 gives us some categories to think in. Um, this verse, which is central to the doctrine of Scripture, which we'll talk about in a bit, but it says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man or man or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Um, I find that, like, I would imagine many of us have memorized this verse or are pretty familiar with it. And in your mind, it's just like, okay, what's the order? Is it teaching, reproof, like, just trying to get it right? But to actually stop and be like, wait, what are those about? <laughs> it can actually be a helpful thing. So we're just going to spend a few minutes, what are those about? But this passage is showing us, I mean, it's a key passage on inspiration. All scripture, this entire book, is breathed out by God. Um, we talk about inspiration. It could also be expiration. It's, it comes from him, um, the very breath of his word, which is an amazing thing. We'll talk about that. All of it, though, is also profitable. It's all beneficial. Whether or not it's the genre that you find most beneficial, uh, it is, which is an amazing promise to us. And the result that it's pointing toward is that we would be equipped, building us up for every good work, these good works that are now the fruit of the gratitude of this new life that we have in Christ. And so this happens through um, teaching. Uh, I, that is poor placement on my part. Let me think through where this is going. Teaching. Okay. When we think about teaching, and again, you could write a book on this, but um, Paul Tripp has these helpful categories. God's Word teaches us the standard of what we need to know. Um, the standard of what we need to know. And I, I think a lot of, you know, when we read Psalm 119 and it's meditating upon the law of God and how it's showing us who God is and the, the wonder of his holiness and righteousness and the ways that lead to life and ways that lead to death. The scripture's teaching us a standard of the life that we were made for. Uh, and so it teaches us that. It also is profitable for reproof. Reproof might not be a word you use every day, but we could summarize that as comparison to the standard. Comparison to the standard. This is the first use of the law. This is the convicting sense of God's word that it does. James talks about this mirror, and you <laughs> look in the mirror uh, thinking this hair in the back is down, and then you look and it reveals to you it's actually not. It's, it's far from that or something like that. That's been an experience of mine as of late. But the, the reproof part is helping us look at what God says, what is true, and what we're to, how we're to believe and live, and it brings correction to that. It, it's showing us, hey, wait a minute. This is not measuring up to who God has made you to be. Um, and this part can be uncomfortable, but I love what um, Paul Tripp says. He says, theological study should produce not only praise and worship of God, but also heartfelt grief, confession, and repentance. Truth does not, that does not reprove or confront is truth not properly handled. It is possible and tempting to handle biblical doctrine unbiblically by omitting or resisting its reproving function. Now, I think it's good to know our own tendencies and our own spiritual journeys as we think about this. Some of us may think that the gospel stops at reproof, <laughs> that what we're supposed to hear on a Sunday is just me slamming on your toes with my foot. And like that is the watering process of gospel transformation. That's not the case. That's, that's just a slice of what this whole picture is supposed to do. On the other end, though, as we think about that dangerous dichotomy, 
is we could be articulating all day long grace and servanthood and um, holiness or whatever and not letting God's word actually reprove and shine a light on those crevices of our hearts where those things really are. And so it's not the whole process, but it can't be left out of the process. And so that's something we just have to keep in mind. So teaches us the standard. It cuts to our hearts and compares us to that standard. And then correction, teaching, reproof, correction. Correction can be said as closing the gap between these two things. It's saying, hey, this is how God has made us to be or how we're to relate to him and to others. Here's where you're not doing that, but here is the way to go in that. Here is what life looks like now in that. And um, I think it's important to say explicitly for all of us, because the gospel can be so easily just set aside, this is gospel correction too. It's, it's not that we are correcting these things in order to be justified or for God to accept us. It is the loving correction of God saying, I have accepted you, welcomed you, glory is yours, but I also am forming that glory in you now as you continue to be conformed to the image of Christ. And here's how I do that conforming work in you. Um, and so it's, it's um, not flipping those things. It's empowered by the Spirit. It's motivated by gratitude. I want to change these things in my life because of how much God has done for me and it wants to do in me. And then finally, um, training. Training. Training in righteousness. It's putting into practice. You know, correction may be saying, hey, <laughs> those words you said were really harsh. We're to seek to not say those words. We're to seek to transform our hearts so we think differently about the person in the situation. And we're given these words that would actually bless and build up instead of tear down. But then there's the training part of, and you wake up and you encounter a person or something. And that training work of um, putting that into practice is part of what God wants to do as his word continues to come back to us saying, put this off, put this on. This is how God views you. You get to show a glimpse of that to this person standing in front of you. So all of God's word is useful for this process. It, it works this process in us, which I think is a great thing to see. And then really, as we bring this all together, and I've been saying this in about 20 different ways, but doctrine is made to change our lives. <laughs> That's what God wants to do through it. Change who we are by how we come to understand his truth. <clears throat> Just a summary statement. Embedded in every doctrine of the word of God is a call to a brand new way of living. So believing in the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and the inexhaustible resources of his grace, we submit to his call to live in a new way. Uh, so it's seeing the beauty of that. So um, that's one through three, and we'll, we'll see if we even start page four because we can just talk about the doctrine of Scripture next week. But I'd like to open it up um, to you all, and I, I just have a few questions that I'd like to hear your experience in because we all have been at this journey for various amounts of time and had various experiences, and I think it's really helpful to hear that. Also, so we know that we're not alone as we struggle with this, like, Doctrine is here to change your life. And we all are sitting here saying, there are parts of my life that have not yet changed. <laughs> and so uh, where are we? So here's, here are my questions. Have you experienced, this is the positive one, have you experienced doctrine changing your life at some point in time? And is there anything you'd like to share about that? There's also the negative side to this. Has a lack of doctrine had a negative effect on your life? Or have you at some point pursued doctrine to the neglect of transformation 
and seen that negative effect too. So has doctrine positively changed you in an experience of that? Or has a lack of it or pursuing it in the wrong way also been harmful to you and you, you see that? Any thoughts on that? I know those are kind of intimate things to share, but Adriana. Um, well, most of y'all know I came from a Pentecostal background for like 18 years, but um, I'd have to say that a lack of a certain type of doctrine really has impacted me in a positive way, especially now being a part of GBC and really understanding the grace of God and how far that reaches. You know, for almost two decades, you know, I was taught that the more you do, the more God will love you and the more you will be accepted. And you were constantly like chasing salvation. Like if, you know, if you did one thing wrong, boom, it's lost. And I think that that is such a paranoid way to live as a Christian too. There's no, um, there's really no comfort. There's no true joy. I mean, cause it's what you have is like fleeting moments of happiness. It's not like that sustained joy you get in the Lord. And it's just been a total awakening. I feel like not a baby Christian, but I feel like, like I've been, you know, reborn truly like because of the new doctrine that I now believe. Um, it's just incredible to see like over my whole life, all the things I thought you had to do to serve God. I mean, there's just too many to list, but I mean, like, for example, what you wore, I mean, you put on a pair of pants as a woman and immediately, boom, you're, you're done. You're, you're not going to heaven. So it's really hard. It was really, really hard. Um, and yeah. then it's still hard to this day seeing my mom and sister struggle with that because they're still uh, in that faith. But um, I'm just so thankful. I mean, and I'm so like, every time I go back home and I see how they're struggling because they don't know what I know now. And I try to tell them, but it's, it's a sensitive topic, but I'm just so thankful that I was able to experience this revelation, like this, God was able to show this to me. And I just, I pray that one day they can feel it too. But. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. So it, it often happens where it's not just a gap of a doctrine, but there can be distorted ones that are also doing damage. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, did I see movement over here? Matt, Jared, do you want to just throw it? Just kidding. Sorry, sound guys. It's a joke. Uh, so for me, I think the doctrine of sanctification has been uh, really helpful and um, just a just kind of like a, a buoy keeping me afloat so often. Um, for all my uh, extra extroverted sort of behavior. I'm very, I, I look at myself often and feel I'm not measuring up. I'm not, um, I'm failing in so many areas. I'm not, you know, um, there's, there's just this sort of, a, there's a lot of condemnation that goes on with that in, in part to that. And then I can remember that he who began a good work in me will bring it to completion. Mm -hmm. And that even though there is my effort and my, you know, uh, putting to death sin and, and living for righteousness, this, it's, it's that work of the Spirit in me and to have the power of God working in my life um, and then to see it as we grow individually together in our marriage and, and with you all. It's, I mean, it's a reason to praise. You see God's faithfulness again and again as the Spirit does His work. So um, that's, that's been a big encouragement for me. Thanks. Uh, Jared, oh yeah, go ahead. Darcy's right there, but Paul's there, but you could get more steps if you want. Go to Paul. <laughs> uh, not, I suppose, a specific doctrine, but uh, I think that for me, uh, learning about the history of doctrine and the way various things have been believed since the ascension of Christ has been incredibly helpful. I'll just give a quick example. There are some things that don't seem as clear as I might like them to be in Scripture, say the New Testament. And then if you just do a survey of books that have been written in the past, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, you get all these differing opinions. Oh, it's like this. No, it's like this. No, that you're wrong. No, you're wrong. Um, and it can be very confusing and frankly overwhelming. But I have found that being able to understand historically how have the 
most trustworthy, eminent church fathers thought about these things, it can be very helpful. I mean, I've found about some of these things, you know, you realize that one view on the subject, it's like everybody since the ascension of Christ, for the most part, has believed this. I mean, everybody. Mm -hmm. And this other view that just happens to seem really interesting lately, it's like some crazy person came up with it a hundred years ago. It's like, he doesn't even know what he's talking about. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's, it can be very helpful for me to understand how it's been accepted over the years. Like, oh, it's just clarifies things so much. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, there's a rich history of doctrine that um, really lets us know we're not alone in these questions. And often there's just great resources to be plumbed and then people who can read those things and understand them and help us understand them. That's always nice too. So that's good. Was there, did you still want to talk, Darcy? You are welcome to share. I can't get a read if that's like, anyhow, I'll just. <laughs> I was just going to say, it's been really interesting um, to watch a journey just in my own life and um, of like certain theologies at certain times in your life, they just come to you in the right way. And it's not that I didn't know something, but maybe really studying it further or whatever. And so lately it's been, obviously sanctification was huge in my walk, but like lately it's been this idea of like our glorification and just what's to come. And, um, and so that's been really sweet to watch that by his spirit, by the Holy Spirit in our own personal lives, there's going to be times where we're going to like we're going to be, there's a gap, you know, and he's going to step in and show us, some, reveal something that's been there in scripture, but it becomes more, I don't know, applicable in your current circumstance. And then the other thing I was going to say is I'm so thankful for this church in particular, but I have been in churches before where for women, at least they don't, they don't grow up thinking that this is for them, mm -hmm. you know, that theology is kind of more men do that. And I, I appreciate that, you know, we want strong male leaders in the church. Um, but I just, that's always made me sad that, that women don't understand. I mean, we're all called to study the word. We're all called to this. And so it's been neat to watch that journey, I, you know, in our church at least. And then it seems like the greater church has seen that gap and is trying to reconcile that as well. So I'm thankful for that. Yeah. Yeah, nothing about these things are only for men. It is a whole body of Christ every time you come to the word thing. And so that's a beautiful thing that intentionally and sometimes unintentionally gets um, not communicated or the opposite being communicated. So, um, yeah, so much could be said, but yeah. It was someone else. I see you coming at me. Is that? Oh, I see. Okay, cool. I already got to speak once, but okay, I'll take another time. Nobody's counting. Uh, I can remember all the way back uh, when I first came to know that God is, and that was the most profound change in my worldview, because before that it was based on, well, we can only know what science teaches us, and so, and then the second was to know that God is good, mm. and his purposes toward us are good. And the third, I think, that was most, uh, most recently kind of uh, world-shaking was the absolute sovereignty of God, hmm. that he is in control of everything, the little things as well as the big things. So that really informs everything that I think gives great comfort that his purposes being good and absolutely will not be thwarted and will be completed to the end. But he is in charge. Hmm. He gets to decide. And so uh, for me to be submitted to that in my life, also uh, I have a tendency not to want to give up control. Say, I I've got this part, Lord, uh, which is contradictory, right? Yeah. If he's Lord, he's Lord. So, um, you know, it's been a process of transformation. And I can't say, I I'd say always that I know things before I really... Um, see their effect and their transformation on me. So there's a bit of a lag, mm -hmm. but thankfully I want it not to be a, a, a permanent gap. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's great. So what you're saying about this being a process of transformation of grace, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I find that that's been his, his work in us. Yeah. That's great. Well, thanks everyone for sharing. And just as we, as we wrap up, um, I'd love for us to just kind of leave with the wonder of, of what we've been talking about, that we left to ourselves would just have lives filled with thorns and tumbleweed, dryness, emptiness. But God in his grace has broken into that, brought water, and says, I'm not even going to just water what's there, but I'll transform what's there into new creation, Christ-like life. One day, we're going to see that for the fullness of what it is, right? The, the mountains and the hills, all of creation clapping and singing when they see the wonder of the lushness of new creation revealed both in the new heavens and new earth, but revealed in us. Um, it will bring cosmic praise and glory to God. And so that's what God is doing, and that's what he, by his grace, has broken in and caused you to see and believe and then that's also a process that by his word, he has perfectly put it together so that it can water your soul in various ways. Um, but just to know the invitation of that, um, I think is what so often our hearts are lacking, is um, just to come to that water and entrust ourselves to his process and to his word as he seeks to grow those things in us. Um, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And, um, and then we get to share those things with each other, even as we've been sharing of, wow, there are these times, these ways that God has watered me throughout my journey. And there are these ways that I, I went through dry times and it felt like there wasn't enough water uh, to really sustain something. But then on the other side, I see roots were going deeper or fruit was getting ready to burst forth that I couldn't see in the time. And so um, hopefully the, the beauty and wonder of a God who loves us enough to be doing this um, can encourage us both in his love and then also as we think about what we're going to hear in a few minutes and sing about and pray about. And then also as we go throughout the week, coming to that water in whatever ways um, we can work into our lives. So let me pray and then we can fellowship together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your love we are reminded, even as we just think about doctrine and as we think about your word, we feel small and unable to grasp a lot of things. We're aware of great mystery in your purposes and even questions that we have about these things that we may never understand until glory. And yet we realize that you are out of your love, helping us to better know you and the love that you have for us and that you are shaping us into a fuller life, uh, an abundant life of becoming more like Jesus as we follow him. So we pray that your spirit would do that work in us. We pray that you'd help us um, to have hearts that examine your word and are reproved by it and trained by it, but then also lives that demonstrate this wholeness of the righteousness that you're cultivating in us that one day we'll have in fullness. We thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.